you know, they've hired Guido now and they've hired a lot of Python developers. Wait, Guido's not yeah. Microsoft? Yeah, he works I, I need Microsoft. to. <laughs> Which uh, he retired, then he came out of retirement and he's working on. I was just talking to him and he didn't mention this part. <laughs> well, <laughs> I should, I should investigate this further. <laughs> Because well, I know he loved Dropbox, but I wasn't sure what he was doing, who, who he was up to. Well, he was kind of saying he'd retire, but, uh, and it's it's literally been five years since I last sat down and really talked to Guido, right? Um, it, Guido's a technology uh, expert, right? He's a, so I, I came, I was excited because I'd finally figured out the type system for, for NumPy. I wanted to kind of talk about that with him and I kind of overwhelmed him. <laughs> Could you like, stay in that mo just for a brief moment? Because you're a fascinating person in the history of programming. He <laughs> is a fascinating person. What have you learned from Guido about yeah. uh, programming, about life? Yeah, yeah, uh, a lot, actually. <laughs> I've, I've been a fan of Guido's, you know, we have a chance to talk some. I wouldn't say, you know, we talk all the time, not really at all, He may, um, but we talked enough to, I respect his, in fact, when I first started NumPy, one of the first things I did was I had a, I, I asked Guido for a meeting with him and Paul Dubois in San Mateo, and I went ha and met him for lunch, and basically, to say maybe we can actually part of the strategy for NumPy was to get it into Python three and maybe be part mm -hmm. of Python. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about that That's and, cool and about that approach, right? I would have loved to be a fly in the wall. That was so. that was good. And and over over the years for Guido, I learned so he was open, like he was willing to listen to people's ideas, <laughs> right? And you know, over the years, now generally, you know, I'm not saying universally that's been true, but but generally that's been true. So he's willing to listen. He's willing to defer. Like on the scientific side, he would just kind of defer. He didn't really always understand what we were doing. Yeah. Like, and he'd defer. One place where he didn't enough was we missed a matrix multiply operator. Like that finally got added to Python, but about 10 years later than it should have. <laughs> but the reason was because nobody, it, took, it takes a lot of effort. And I learned this while I was writing NumPy. I also wrote tools to, I became a Python dev and I added some pieces to Python. Um, like the memory view object. I wanted mm -hmm. the structure of NumPy into Python. So we didn't get NumPy into Python, but we got the basic structure of it into Python. Like, so you could build on it. Nobody did for a while, but eventually database authors started to. And it was it's a lot better they did. And also Antoine Petro and Stefan Craw actually fixed the memory view object because I wrote the underlying infrastructure in C, but the Python exposure was terrible until they came in and fixed it, partly because I was writing NumPy and I didn't, it, NumPy was the Python exposure. I didn't really care about if you didn't have NumPy installed. Anyway, Guido opened up ideas, technologically, you know, brilliant. Like really, uh, I really got a lot of respect for him when I saw what he did with the with the this type class merger thing. It was actually tricky, right? And then and then willing to share, willing to share his ideas. So the other thing early on in 1998, I said I start wrote my first extension module. The reason I could is because he'd written this blog post on how to do reference counting. Right? And without it, I would have been lost. Right, but he was he was willing to at least try to write this post, and so he's been motive he's been motivated early on with Python. There's a computer science for everybody. Mm -hmm. He kind of had this early on desire to oh maybe we should be pushing programming to more people. So he had this populist notion, I guess, or populist sense um, to learn that th there's a certain skill, and I've seen it in other people too, of engaging with contributors sufficiently to because when somebody engages with you and wants to contribute to you, if you ignore them, they go away. So building that early contributor base requires real engagement with other people, and he would do that. Can you also comment on this tragic uh, stepping down from his position as the benevolent dictator for life over the wars? Uh, uh, you know, the walrus he, operator. The walrus <laughs> operator was the ba last battle. I, I don't know if that's the cause of it, but uh, this there's this for people who don't know. You can look up. There's the walrus operator, which is uh, looks like a colon and, and equal sign. Yeah, colon and, equal sign. And um, it actually does maybe the thing that you that an equal sign should be doing. Yeah, <laughs> maybe right exactly. Uh, if, yeah, but it's just historically equal sign means something else. It just means assignment. So he stepped down over this. What do you think about the pressure of leadership? You, I, you, I, it's some of that you mentioned the letter I wrote in, in NumPy at the time. Yes. That, that was a hard time, actually. I mean, you know, there's been really hard times. It was hard. You know, you, you get criticized, right? And you get pushed, and you get um, not everybody loves what you do. Like anytime you do anything that has impact at all you're not universally loved, right? You get some real critics. And that's an important energy because it's impossible for you to do everything right. You need people to be pushing. But sometimes people can get mean, yeah. right? People can, I, I I prefer to give people the benefit of the doubt. I don't immediately assume they have bad intentions. Mm -hmm. 
and maybe for other, you know, maybe other, maybe that doesn't happen for everybody. They, for whatever reason, their past or their experience of people, they, they sometimes have bad, in, they, 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 so they immediately attribute to you bad intentions. So you're like, where did this come from? I mean, I definitely open to criticism, but I think you're misinterpreting the whole point. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause I, I, I would get that, you know, certainly when I started Anaconda, you know, I, I've been, sometimes I say to people, uh, I know I'm, I care enough about entrepreneurship to make some open source people uncomfortable. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I care enough about open source to make investors uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So I sort of, you know, create you, you create kind of doubters on both sides. So when you have, and, and this is just a, a plea to the listener and the public, I've noticed this too, that there's a tendency, and social media makes this worse, when you don't have perfect information about the situation, you tend to fill the gaps with the, with the worst possible, yes. or at least the bad, a uh, story that fills those gaps. And, yes. and I think it's good to live life, uh, maybe not fully naively, but filling in the gaps with the, with the, with the good, with the best, with the positive, with the, with the hopeful explanation of why you see this. So if you see somebody like you trying to make money on a book about NumPy, there's a million stories around that that are positive. And th- those are good to think right. about. Uh, to uh, project positive intent on the people because uh, for many reasons, usually because people are good and they do have good intent. And also when you project that positive intent, people will step up to that <laughs> too. Yes. So like it's, it has it's this- great point. It has this kind of viral nature to it. And of course, what Twitter early on figured out and Facebook is that they can make a lot of money and engagement from the negative. Yes. And, and so like there's this, we're fighting this mechanism. I agree. Which is challenging. It's like easier. It's just easier to be- To be negative. <laughs> and then for some reason, something in our minds really enjoys sharing that and getting getting all excited about the negativity. We do, yeah. But, but Some protective all, mechanism perhaps that we're you know, worried we're gonna eat if we don't. Yeah. Exactly. For us to be effective as a group of people in a software engineering project, you have to project positive intent, I think. I totally agree, totally agree. And I think that's very, and so that that happens in this in this space, but Python has done a reasonable job in the past, but here's a situation where I think it's it started to get this pressure where it didn't. I was, I, I really didn't, I didn't know enough about what happened. I've you know talked to several people about it and I know I think most of the steering committee members today, uh, one, one person nominated me for that role, but I, it's the wrong role for me right now, right? Um, I, I have a lot of respect for the Python developer space and the Python developers. I also understand the gap between computer science Python developers and array programming developers or science developers. And in fact, Python succeeds in the array space the more it has people in that boundary. Mm-hmm. And there's often very few. Like I was playing a role in that boundary and you know, working like everything to try to keep up with the with the what even what Vita was saying. Like I'm a C programmer, but not a computer scientist. Like I was a engineer and physicist and mathematician and I don't. I didn't always understand what they were talking about mm-hmm. and why they would have opinions the way they did. So you know, you have to listen and try to understand. Then you also have to explain your point of view in a way they can understand, mm-hmm. and that takes a lot of work. And that that communication is always the challenge. And it's just what we're describing here about the negativity is just another form of that. Like, how do we come together? And it does appear we are wired anyway to at least have a. There's a part of us that will enemy, you know, friend, enemy, and right. and <laughs> we see. Yeah, it's like why are we wiring on the enemy front? Yeah. So, so why are we pushing that? Why are we promoting that so deeply? Ass- assume friend until proven otherwise. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, so, cause you have such a fascinating mind and all of this, let me just ask you these questions. So one interesting side on the Python history is the move from Python two to Python three. You mentioned w- move from Python one to Python two, but the, <laughs> the move from Python two to Python three is a little bit interesting because it took a very long time. It, uh, it broke in a, quite a small way backward compatibility, but even that small way seemed to have been very painful for people. Is there lessons you oh, man, draw- tons of lessons. <laughs> from, uh, from how long it took and how painful it seemed to be? Yeah, tons of lessons. Well, I mentioned here earlier that Num- NumPy was written in 2005. It was in 2005 that I, w- I actually went to Guido to talk about getting NumPy into Python 3. Like mm-hmm. my strategy was to, Oh, we were moving to Python three. Let's have that be. And it seems funny in retrospect because, like, wait, Python three that was in 20, yeah. 2020, right? When we finally <laughs> ended support for Python two, or at least twenty seventeen. The reason I mean, it took a long time, a lot of time, I think, it was because well, one of the things is there wasn't much to like about Python three, three point oh, three point one. It really wasn't until three point three. Like, I consider Python three point three to be Python three point oh. It wasn't until Python three point three that I felt there's enough 
stuff in it mm -hmm. to make it worth anybody using it, mm -hmm. right? And then three, four started to be, oh yeah, I want that. And then three, five as the matrix multiply operator. And now it's like, okay, we got to use that. Plus the libraries that started leveraging the, some of the features of Python 3. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it really, the, the challenge was, it was, but it also illustrated a, a truism that, you know, it's <laughs> when you have inertia, when you have a pot, when you have a group of people using something, it's really hard to move them away from it. You can't just change the world on them. And Python 3, you know, it made some, I think it fixed some things Guido had always hated. I don't I think he didn't like the fact print was a statement. Wanted to make it a function, but in some sense, that's a bit of gratuitous change to the language. And you could argue, and there's there people have, <laughs> but there was uh, one of the challenges was there wasn't enough features and too many just changes mm -hmm. without features. And so that empathy for the end user as to why they would switch wasn't wasn't there. I think also it illustrated just the funding realities. Like Python wasn't funded; like it was also a project with a bunch of volunteer labor. Right, it had more people, so more volunteer labor. But it was still, it was funded in the sense that at least Guido had a job, and I, I, I've learned some of the behind the scenes on that now since since talking to people who mm -hmm. lived through it, and uh, maybe not on air. We can talk about some yeah. of that, <laughs> but it's but, interesting to see. But Guido had a job, but he, but his full time job wasn't just work on Python. Yeah, like he had other things to do. This is wild. It is wild, isn't it? It's wild how few people are funded. Yes. And how much impact they have. It's, yes. It's, maybe that's a feature, not a bug. I don't know. Maybe, but yes, exactly. Maybe. At least early on. like I, It's sort of, I know, yeah. It's like uh, Olympic athletes are often severely underfunded, but maybe that's what brings out the greatness. Perhaps. <laughs> yes, correct. No, exactly. Maybe this is the essential part of it. Because I do think about that in terms of, I currently have an incubator for open source startups. Like What I'm trying to do right now is create the environment I mm -hmm. wished had existed when I was leaving academia with NumPy and trying to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to create those opportunities and environments. So, uh, and that's, that's what drives me still is how do I make the world easier for the open source entrepreneur?